Welcome everyone to the Co-Creators Convergence Thursday Night Creator Combos. I'm Noelle Marshall and I'm here with my beloved Bob Warner. Good evening everyone. Thank you for being with us. Wonderful to have you here this evening, Simran and Jennifer. And we are uh, really happy to see everyone here and all of you out in Facebook land and all of you that will pick this up later uh, as we keep everything uh, archived on our CoCreatorsConvergence.com. So um, before we begin, I'm going to do, play a short video to tell you a little bit about the CoCreators Convergence. So please stand by. turn this over to my dear friend, traveling companion, meditation teacher, so many wonderful things to me, Jennifer Ivanko. And I just want to tell you a little bit about Jennifer before she introduced her guest, Simran Singh, for the evening. So Jennifer is a soul mentor, mentor human potentialist. And as a soul mentor, she is adept at facilitating the rich inner experiences that will enable you to expand your awareness, access your hidden resources, and activate your deepest spiritual, sensory, and multidimensional capacities. She also has a radio show, and I want you to tell everyone a little bit about your radio show, uh, Jennifer, and then I'm going to turn it over to you to center us and welcome our wonderful guests. We're so excited, We've been looking forward to this all month. So over to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Noelle and Bob, and, and uh, so excited to be back here with Co-Creators -Cre Convergence. Um, the show I have is called Adventures in Consciousness. Uh, we meet twice a, a month on the first and third Tuesday. And the first thurs, uh, Tuesday we do um, an interview with a guest to talk about um, different things, topics in consciousness. So we had Simran in um, this, this last month. Then we have our second show each month is an experience and we take a um, right now we're going through the dimensions of self again inspired by uh, Simran's work. We're taking meditation journeys in through the dimensions of self. Uh, next, our next show is this coming Tuesday and we will be going into the dream dimension with a conversation with uh, Framika Coriander. And then we will have an experience um, later in May about uh, the dream. Um, the dream dimension. So now I'd like to take a moment and bring us through a centering meditation and then we will welcome Simran. So if you go ahead and make yourself comfortable and close your eyes and bring your awareness to your breath. Not change in your breath, just be aware of how you're breathing. Now deepening your breath just a little, noticing your chest rise and fall with each breath.
And with your awareness on your breath for a moment, I'd like you to imagine you can play a little movie in your mind's eye, starting from when you woke up this morning. You're just stretching and getting out of bed. And going to the restroom and brushing your teeth and getting ready for the day. Just begin to move through your day with your inner eye and your vision. The people you saw, the places you went, what you ate for your meals. Paying attention to how you connected with people during the day. And keep on moving. Do you get to your dinner? Until you turned your computer on to come to our meeting. And then observe yourself now sitting here, opening up and ready for some interesting conversation and connection. And I invite you to ask that beautiful soul question, who am I through this day, in this moment? Who am I? Now imagining all the people that are here with you, that you're sitting around a circle with them, sharing your time, your awareness, and sharing that breath again, bringing your awareness to that breath as you breathe in and out. Finding yourself here in this moment. Taking a deep breath in and releasing. And when you're ready, slowly opening your eyes with a big smile and looking around yourself. Very nice. So welcome everyone here. It's wonderful to spend this evening with you and with our wonderful guest, Simran Singh. Simran is a globally recognized speaker and catalyst of love, compassion, and humanity. She's a soul artist and a mentor, as well as publisher of 1111 Magazine, host of 1111 Talk Radio, and guide for 1111 Interviews TV. I love that. <laughs> Simran is also an author of the multi-award winning books, author of many multi-award winning books. And this year she's releasing her latest trilogy on living, being, and knowing. Welcome Simran. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you, with this community. Uh, feels really, really good. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. So you've released your first book in a trilogy. We're going to jump in because we have so much to go through. <laughs> you've released your first book in the trilogy, and the title is Living the Seven Blessings of Human Experience. And one of the ways you describe this book is as a guidebook that allows individuals to release re restlessness, boredom, angst, anxiety, and depression about life's more dense experiences, so to live with greater presence and personal power. And uh, this guidebook came out of navigating your own journey and your own experiences. So I think a good place to start is if you could tell us a little bit about who is Simran and the journey that brought you to write this book. Absolutely. Uh, I, I'll start off by saying that the purpose of this book specifically, but the combination of the three books 
that actually make up the multidimensional being that we are is to reframe some of the experiences that we have in life so that we are not approaching them from the state of such separation consciousness as we have been. The types of blessings listed in living are unorthodox. And so they are going to be things that typically we wanna shrink back from or shrug away from or not fully feel. And the reason that I came to want to write these particular pieces is because I went through some experiences that were very difficult and I started to notice that there's an actual cycle that takes place. Simran is in its literal meaning is remembrance of the divine. It's basically remembering that one is the divine speaking to itself, listening to its own words, um, being in such a communion space with the divine that your knowing of becoming that is awakened within you. So that's a big name to live up to. And I think that we all uh, have these anointings just by mere naming of who we are. It's almost as if I always knew, okay, this is who I have to grow into. But a lot of my life was completely the opposite of that. It was the forgetting. It was the longing rather than the belonging. It was uh, the insecurity, the hiding, the uh, inability to be heard and seen, not just by people outside, but more so by myself. And so my nickname was Simi. And, and I came to realize what it really was saying was see me, see me. And it was about seeing myself. And so this seven year journey and the seven has many different significances as um, if, if you want to know about those later, but the seven year journey that unfolded was a disintegration process for me through many dense emotions, particularly grief was the deepest one. And through that dissolving that took place, I began to become aware of multidimensional aspects of myself that were occurring at the same time. And that is why it's divided up into the three books. Living the seven blessings of human experience is the self that's uh, robotic, asleep, unconscious, conditioned, the homogenized person that we are, the dream walker, the one that's adorned in identities and masks that is attempting to make sense of life that is often surviving, um, sometimes thriving, but really just trying to figure out what life is about and keep moving um, in that direction and often relies much on its own ego to do so. And so that's the place that I decided to start because that's the person that was encountering the seven blessings. Wow. So uh, you mentioned about the multidimensional aspect that we are, um, and you've written this book in a very specific way to, to highlight, spotlight that in us and help us recognize where we're coming from. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. As I started writing it, um, it, well, as I went through my seven year experience, what I began to know was, okay, there's not just me here. There's never just been the one me here that is the person who believes she's conscious, but like most of us is more often unconscious than conscious. And I'm walking through life, but for the things that are showing up in my life to be taking place that are challenging, there has to be another aspect of me that is operating. And we all kind of know that if we've been in the spiritual and personal growth field for a while and we've done a lot of healing work, we kind of put that on the inner child, we put that on the shadow, but that's kind of held separate for the moments that we're actually having to do that kind of work. Otherwise, we tend to stay in our personality or identity and kind of forget that that piece is there. And so that's the really, really subtle place that separation exists. There's a separation consciousness within us where we're not united within the self with all aspects of self at the same time. And so I wrote the book in a way where number one, it would slow people down to become very, very present. And so that the repetition of these words would allow them to bring more into their awareness of every moment of every day that, okay, it's not just me, the mask, the identity, the personality, the conscious or the unconscious person, but I've got these other two aspects that are with me at the exact same time, having their own experience of the situation. 
And it's up to me whether I'm going to go to the lower octave or the higher octave in this moment to live out this particular experience. And so the words that are written, for example, the word you, Y-O-U, the lowercase Y-O-U would signify that part of us that is shadow. Uh, my second book, which is coming out at the end of May, is being the seven illusions that derail personal power, purpose, and peace. And that's that Y-O-U that's lowercase. That's the self that's lowercase that represents the obsessed nature of personhood that's ignorant of its own vices, unconsciously obedient to the shadow, the animal, and even the monster expressions that live inside of us, that even has that demon expression that's inside of us that creates some of the horrors in the world that we don't want to believe we have anything to do with. But for those of us that understand what collective consciousness is, it's the very suppressed and repressed part of us that um, exudes energies that do, does contribute to those things being created. Um, this lowercase u is the aspect that we act out of our deepest cravings and our hunger. It's the distracted part of us. It's the part of us that's possessed by our inner demons. And then there's this capital Y, lowercase OU, which is the one that lives through the blessings, which is what we're gonna talk about today. And then there's a third part of us that's capital Y, capital O, capital U. And that's the one that starts to unfold through the third book, which is knowing the seven human expressions of grace. And that's our humanity. Many of us think that we have humanity or we think humanity is this larger collective composite that's outside of us. But in truth, most of us, unless we've really been willing, willing to feel the full depths of our emotions, both dense and ecstatic, we really don't know what our humanity is. And so this is really about the flowering of humanity in order to touch the essence of divinity that's with, within us. And the seven blessings of human experience is this reoccurring cycle of things that happen throughout our lives in order to actually get us to that place, that place of beautiful flowering humanity. But we have to be willing to face those blessings, to embrace them head on and fully allow ourselves to immerse in everything that they bring in order to get there. It's interesting, you, you pick up the book and it talks about the seven blessings, but then you read these seven blessings and you're talking about you know darkness chaos um all these these kind of tough experiences that we have in life and it go ahead we, we, use kind of, we kind of in a in a very subtle way talk about silver linings you know every cloud has a silver lining or we we make these statements to people when they're going through hard things like um, god doesn't give you more than you can handle or, um, you know, the time will heal all things. And we're kind of saying in a certain way that, okay, this, this is something of significance and meaning, but that's also a bit of brushing off of the real truth of what this is. So I wanted to bring light and reframe these unorthodox blessings, because if I look at my life, the places that I have grown the most have been through these types of experiences. These are the experiences that have me shed skins, that have me dissolve identities, that allow me the place of rebirth. And in spirituality and personal growth, we have this statement about be more of who you are, but that's actually contradictory to where we really are wanting to go. Because to be more of who we are is to follow kind of the ego's idea of what that is. And the ego will send us down all kinds of scenic routes to have agendas and, you know, go build something and go create something or go think we have to go fix, heal and save everybody out of our own need for significance or applause or worth or whatever that is. But in truth, if we allowed ourselves to face these unorthodox blessings, what would happen is we would, in, we would really become less of who we have come to believe we are. And we would shed all these masks, these dressings, these costumes, one by one that are identities. And we would start to become essence. We would start to discover the God self and to embody the full God nature. We would not have any of these other identities. And thus those unorthodox blessings would at that point cease. But until then, 
these blessings are helping to crack apart those uh, coverings that we kind of cling to that are not really the truth of who we are. I like that um, description because I can, I think most of us on this call can relate to times in our life when we had our deepest sorrow or pain or, or challenge and how profound afterwards, once we survive and get through it, once we embrace it, how it can be really quite transformational. And we all have that. I mean, we've all had those drop to your knees moments or those places of grief where the heart is shattered or the mind just simply can't fathom what has happened. And we're left with this echoing question of why. And it's in those moments that we often isolate. We often step back and we pull away from people and we are trying to figure things out or people pull away from us out of their own fear of their emotions or not knowing how to support us and not knowing what to say. And so as I went through my experience in the seven year process, that was part of what kind of organically took place. Everyone disappeared. And there I was in this really deeply painful experience where the tears just would not stop for months and months and months on end. One, an experience that left me at a place where I had no desire to inspire anyone. I had no uh, thing left within me that wanted to create anything. I had hit that place of not knowing uh, whether I could hang on to the faith that I had or whether, you know, it, whether hope was really something that was a shadow or a light. All these questions that come up when we do hit those really, really difficult moments. And I started to go through what I knew to do, which was if I've created this in my life and I am a creator of my reality, then I must have missed something within myself that is really, really valuable. And I heard within myself, my own voice say, will you commit to the darkness as much as you have devoted yourself to the light? Will you devote to the darkness in that way? And I paused and I thought, that's what this is asking of me. I have been of the light. I have spread light. I have shared beautiful things. But what if that wasn't real light? What if that was nice and beautiful and served? But what if there is a light that is more real than that? And of course, where would it be but in the darkness? And so in that moment, I decided to commit myself to whatever this experience was going to take me through and as deeply into the darkness as it would go until the darkness told me it was complete and I could find the gold within it. And I inherently knew there would be gold. There would be awareness that I could not get to any other way. And that is how I have come through all of the information in these three books. It has been completely experiential and it has also been the soul language uh, to create the manual that the soul would have given us had we come in with one when we were born. So when you talk about um, the blessings, you have challenges, obstacles, conflict, chaos, darkness, and death. Are they progressive? Or did you go through them in that order? Or how did you pick those seven? Um, those were progressive. The, that was the order that I encountered. And when I look back at my life, at anything that has taken place, that is the cycle that we will go through. And as I went through this cycle, I started to uncover seven levels within each blessing that would either take us more deeply into that experience or give us the opportunity to rise to a higher octave. And so it's within those seven levels, levels of the blessing that we can uncover what is the technology of being human, which is energy, truth, growth, and wisdom. And there's different pieces of that through each blessing. But then these innate gifts come with each specific blessing. And that's what started to open up in me were certain gifts that I didn't even know I had, but I had to be willing to cross that threshold of that specific blessing. And then I would find myself in the next one. Did you ever think it was going to end as you were going through them? You know, I, I kept wondering how long is this going to take, but it was about midway through that all of a sudden I had gone through so much 
in terms of thought processes. And I had had truly more grief than I thought my body could hold water. And then I started to have these really strong physical sensations, pain within the body that had no explanation. My mind could try to make up stories about it, but I knew that what my mind wanted to say about it wasn't accurate. I knew that it was simply sensations and that my only job was to breathe through it. And then the awareness came that the sensations were actually what my body took on from age zero to seven of my childhood. So that's another reason why seven is so significant in this series is because everything that we encounter throughout life, it all stems back to that zero to seven period of what we took on as sensation within the body. And so as I allowed my body to feel those things and breathe those sensations, they would start to dissolve. And then any of those pains or aches or anything that was taking place would completely disappear. But I had to be willing to be that present to it. And I could link it to other events that would occur in seven year increments to match that. And I talk about that in the book, how we create these echoes of experience from that zero to seven period, just to keep taking us back to what the body took on for us before we were able to comprehend what life was really about. Hmm. That kind of brings me into where I wanted to go next with, with time. Um, you talk about the, the, that we exist in space in all times and all dimensions. Um, but I loved your comment, time is an illusion. Memory is a vis visual sensation that mind attaches story to. So that's what you're saying here with the body. Yes, absolutely. In the second book, I talk about the illusion of time and how we really are timeless, but we get so caught up in this illusion of time and past and future that we get more wrapped up in this reality that is really just a speck in the spectrum of timelessness. And yet we think it's so real. And with that, we start to create all of these blessings. Time is part of the process that starts. So as you go through the book, there are all these grids in there. And there's not just the grids that are vertical that help you move through each blessing, but then there are grids that go across the books, living, being, and knowing. So the illusions correlate to the blessings. The illusion of time correlates to the blessing of life. And, and so that's how that piece works. And as you get into the third book, knowing, it goes through the visceral parts of us that start to dissolve. Each of the seven steps actually has a certain visceral quality, visceral memory, uh, visceral resentment. There are different pieces that we pulled into our body that are so incredibly subtle that until we're willing to really sit with the body, we don't realize them. And that's part of the reason that I wrote these three books. I took the time to sit for seven years. I don't know a whole lot of people that would stop their life for seven years to just sit and feel and allow this information to come in. And so that other people don't have to quite go through that process the awarenesses are here for them to then become present too. So in, I'm hoping that these manuals will allow people to be more present through the processes that they have, but not have to spend the extended period of time that I did, because I've already done that work for them. I definitely believe in an energy in certain books and when they're, they're written from that essential place, you, can, you, you do learn from the book, from the energy you do take it in and integrate it. So I, I feel that in your book. I also notice, um, I mean, a lot of, you, you have some profound short paragraph statements that some, I'm sure many of us have been studying and, and doing this path for a long time and we read these and it's saying things that we know, but I imagine when you're working with the blessing, it reaches in at a different level. It does, the, the books definitely carry a vibration within them, the way the wording is done, particularly the triplicate wording, it does something to bypass the ego and the mind so that you're really tapping into soul knowing. And then in moving through the way the book is designed with these pieces that break it up, it allows the essence within to come forward. It's an interesting process. The books are medicine within themselves. They're not something to go through quickly 
<laughs> by any means. Uh, I do say to people, when you get these books, these are books you're probably going to be reading other things alongside, because I only want you to read a couple of lines, a short paragraph or a page a day. That is really about all you're going to be able to take because there's so much information there. It, it, it really is energetic and vibratory as well as with the words. And so most of it is going to be speaking to parts of you beyond the mind. Um, and, and it's going to slow you down. So as you were going through these blessings yourself, did you have that experience where I'm sure at some point where you observe time going through you instead of you going through time and you were able to separate? It, it was the most present seven years I've ever experienced. It was um, to give oneself to their full bandwidth of emotion and really be swallowed whole by it takes you into a completely different dimension that is timeless. Mm -hmm. And while there is this experience of fully feeling, there's also this otherworldly experience that's taking place where you are seeing yourself at these different dimensions. You're in it, yet you're outside of it and you're above it and you're around it. It's, it's hard to even put that part into words. And, and I think that that's much of the reason I didn't write my personal story within this book. I really wanted people to put their own life into the book. I didn't want anything to distract um, because we are a species that is so easily distracted. And the intention of these books is for each person to have a really deeply communal process with themselves to fully become present to the divine aspect, the human aspect, the shadow aspect, and have such a love affair by the end of this with all aspects of themselves that there is no separation left inside of them. And the more of us that do that, then how can there possibly be separation outside of us after that? There can't possibly be. And whatever illusion is going to exist, because this is a world of duality, it's intended to be that way. And then all of a sudden we realize that despite whether or not freedom exists outside, freedom can exist inside. Whether there's oppression outside, there will be no oppression inside. And that's ultimately how we transcend this type of dimension, whereas the dual experiences occur. And I, I love how you embrace all three levels. It's not like you're just trying, I mean, when I started on this path, it was about getting to that U with the capital letters and that was it, wow experience but it's remembering that we want to, I think you put it beautifully when you said your task is not to ascend to spirit, but to for spirit to descend into to your awareness and become embodied within form, yes. engage a heavenly experience on earth. Yes, yes, because you know I think that that's one error that we as, as those that are light workers and in the spiritual field are somehow slipping unconsciously into we want to just be of what our ego or our minds are saying is the light, which is that part of us that is only, you know, in the highest vibration that only speaks of love and light, that only uh, is exuding this, this particular image or expression of who we are. But that is separation consciousness. Mm -hmm. We are all of these parts of us that have existed throughout time. So that child that was wounded when she was four years old she's not gone anywhere in timelessness. She's still right here existing. And for us to deny that or push it away or say, I've healed that and it's no longer me, that is creating the separation inside of us. And that is also judging that side of us. And so these are the places where the love and the compassion and the unity has to take place first before we can ever have a, a world of love, compassion, and unity. And that's my hope, because the one thing I know is that if we as light workers are holding any type of separation or judgment or hierarchy, our power to focus, our power of light is stronger than those that are unconscious, which means it is more of our energy that creates what's going on in the outer world than even those vast numbers that are unconscious. And it's because of, of the lack of awareness within ourselves. And not everyone's gonna like that statement, 
But if we really sit and think about it and contemplate it, I think you'll find that that is truth, that we can still find separation within ourselves. And that's the place that we have to bring back to union. Mm, beautifully said. Thank you. Um, I want to actually play with one of these blessings just to go in a little bit deeper. And as I told you before we started, I, I was looking at chaos because I figured that was something we could all relate to. But I have to laugh because um, you probably know that chaos is on page 111, right? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very funny. And it's on page 222 in the back of the book <laughs> with the grids. <laughs> and what's also interesting is how this this episode opened up because you opened us up with calm and grounding and breathing. And isn't that the perfect place for chaos to show up? <laughs> <laughs> so with, with that in mind, can you start? Um, I love how you described chaos on, I think, one page, 112. Yes. A little bit about chaos. Yes. You... Chaos is definitely, um, definitely confetti. I would have to say that. Um, <laughs> What I, what I say about chaos uh, to start off is open your eyes, there is nothing. Close your eyes, there is no thing. Open your eyes, there's everything. Close your eyes, there is everything. What exists does so to the degree that you are present. Life is a choice, one that you can make in every moment, so choose well. And chaos is a part of life. It is that convoluted, eruptive time where something new is actually coming into creation. If we look at how the whole universe and cosmos was created out of the Big Bang, it was an explosion of chaos. That's, that's the perfect place of rebirth. But what that has to come from, the blessing prior to that is the blessing of conflict. So there has to be that friction. There has to be those opposing forces first uh, that would take place for then chaos to erupt. And we can even see that, you know, if we look at, at Ukraine and Russia, you know, there's these two forces and the chaos has erupted. So there are lots of ways you can find that taking place, but it will always come from that specific moment. And when we are in that place of, of chaos, there is a specific path that we're going to follow. Each of the blessings has a particular path that we are to embody. And in this particular case, it is the path of the humanitarian. It is the one that is willing to have empathy. It is the one that is willing to see the other, whether it is the dominant force uh, or whether this is the force being dominated, to see the other uh, from a different set of eyes, from a place within where you see the mirror of that. And so that path of humanitarian has everything to do with um, you know, what we're obsessed about. It's the illusion of obsession. The personal obsessions is what it gets into in the second book. I talked about how there's a vertical grid, which would have been, you know, path of the humanitarian. And then it goes into the energy of earth, which has everything to do with grounding and what's the truth, really rooting oneself in a solid space while the, the chaos flurries around you. That then awakens the growth of the physical, which means mastering the physical experience mastering one's body if you're going through a health crisis or mastering one's environment if you're going through a war uh, or a divorce or mastering one's uh, budget and, and home and bank account if you're going through a financial struggle. So that chaos can show up a lot of different ways. And once we awaken that growth as the physical, that is then restored by the truth and stillness. So we have to get really, really still. And let the chaos swirl around us. The only way to really clear chaos is to do nothing. But what we typically do as human beings and on this planet is we see chaos, so we interfere even further. And that interference just causes more chaos. But if we can stop and really sit back and let the chaos wear itself out, then all of a sudden we start to see a clear path. So that comes through stillness. And in that stillness, we find the wisdom of listening which is the fifth step in the blessing of chaos. And that listening, although it has to do what's going on outside, it's even more so about what's going on inside. Because typically chaos only shows up when you're really going against something that is really right for you. 
And if the chaos is there, it's asking you, you know, what identity really needs to be let go of? What am I gripped to that's really too strongly held that needs to be let go of? And so it's important to really step back and listen. And that then moves you into the sixth step, which is the invitation for unification. And in this case, it has to do with the feminine aspect. And there's a lot of talk about uh, balancing our feminine energies, but the most important of the feminine energies, particularly through this series of blessings, would have everything to do with the dark feminine. It would be about feeling all of the depth of those darker emotions and touching those so that those could equilibrate and not only be balanced within oneself, but be able to be balanced in the world. And when we do that, we then allow the seventh step, which are the gifts. And in this case, it's the gifts of communication, empathy, and intuition that start to awaken. So this is not just a ladder of how to get through the chaos. This is also that ladder of ascension of how to rise to a higher octave for the soul to have the greatest experience and expression that it desired through you as it came to this planet. And if you'd like me to, Jennifer, I can tell you how living connects to being across the board, like what correlates to being and knowing within the blessing of chaos. I'd like to see that, but I, I just want to point out first these seven steps that you just went through, just to get an idea of when you, when somebody's actually living that, how, how you moved from, like you have the path, finding the path and then the energy, you found these solutions because you were looking, you knew these seven existed, these seven steps? I found these paths because I sat still and I began listening and I started asking myself the questions. So the awarenesses came up through me um, and I had a real sense of all of this. And then one day when I went walking after a walking meditation, I came home and I streamed three table of contents. Mm. These three table of contents came out and they laid them out exactly. And when I looked at them, I became aware, this is what I'm living. This is exactly what I've been doing. So innately, whether it was registered in my subconscious as I was moving through the awareness or whether it was also the universe providing me that insight as I was continuing through, um, it, it does work out this way. If, if individuals follow the path and follow them, the energy, truth, growth, and wisdom within each of the blessings, they will come to the unification piece and they will come to the gifts that are given. That's, it's beautiful because that's a lot clearer about this being a manual or a guide that you can be in the depths of something like something very chaotic or conflict or death. And there, there's the ladder, like you say, to climb your way out to, to, or to fully experience it and integrate it. Yes. And because we're going to go through this spiral over and over again, that is how we continue to expand into our greater essence. You know, I have died so many times in this lifetime because there's so many identities that had to crack away. And so every death is that rebirth, but we have to be willing to fully engage the blessing of life in order to experience that full spiral of blessings that will keep rising us higher and higher. And that's what we came to this planet for. You know, the, the beautiful miracles and the quote unquote, great good blessings are fabulous and wonderful. And yes, shower me with those anytime, any day. But the ones that I'm going to grow through and really expand into the best are going to be these kinds of things. And so it's about meeting these with reverence when they show up and understand that it really is simply experience. It's not good. It's not bad. It's not, you know, anything that's trying to hurt you. It's really the karma, which is the illusion of beliefs that were taken on in childhood has created this type of karma that is also resulting in the dharma that we're here for. And that's what I ultimately found out was my karma of believing the illusions and believing the energies and feelings that I was taking on from other people is what has resulted in my life's work. It's mm -hmm. like the quote that Barbara Marks Hubbard uh, was, was shown to have said in the beginning slides that when we find that one true thing that is ours to do, then that's what we are here to do. And these books, these manuals, and being able to 
be the example to other individuals to say, are you willing to face everything that's in your world to the deepest degree for yourself, for your personal and spiritual growth to the highest extent that you can go, but also to be that ripple in the world because it will impact collective consciousness for each of us to do this type of work. And I know it's not always the easiest type of work, but it is the most impactful and the most powerful and it brings the greatest personal power, purpose and peace. I don't know about anybody else that's listening, but it makes me want to embrace these now. Like, okay, bring it on. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we are that powerful. And when we reframe them in this way, then all of a sudden it, they don't have to be as scary. They don't have to be as traumatic. They don't have to be uh, something that takes us down in that type of oppressive victim way. All of a sudden now it, it truly becomes that hero's journey from the empowered place of, oh yes, this is my path of service, not only to my soul, but it's the path of service to the collective soul, to this planet. By me willing to uh, release my tears, the sacred waters from within me, I am allowing myself to become the doorway and the portal for my mother and my grandmother's tears that they never cried, for uh, the collective feminine's tears that have been held back. And that's what I really tapped into after each span of grief completed, there would be this kind of pause where I was resting in timelessness. And then all of a sudden, another wave would come forth. And it was like, what is this? And then I realized, oh, wow, I'm tapping into now ancestral. And then that paused. And then another wave came. And it was, oh, I'm tapping into the collective feminine, the woman grief that that has not been felt throughout time and so we release this backlog of energies for one another when we're willing to really be present to the sacred story that has been our own collective story when i when i speak with someone such as yourself i love how accessible it is that your truth what you're speaking all of us have all of us can experience all of us can go through so thank you i'd like to um, i'd love to talk more but i think we should open up to the um to the group and see if there's any questions before we go any further. So, Noel. <laughs> yes, I've uh, made it so everyone can uh, turn on their video and unmute if you like to, or you can put comments or questions in. Um, I'm going to put this into gallery view. So, anyone who would like to jump in is more than welcome. So, uh, we can be formal or informal if you want to just uh, wave if you have a comment or question. I love informal. <laughs> hey, I want to go get a tux on. Good. Uh, <laughs> Simran, okay. would you, Dr. Oh, Pamela, go ahead. go ahead. Hi. Simran, I am just enthralled because I feel like I have met a true uh, soul sister um, and Kathy is very aware and I've shared some of my experiences too but I have this beautiful blueprint for the human spirit that's a grid you know like a matrix and uh, it's all about uh, finding oneness and creating that letting go of separation in in all these different dimensions and stuff and and then ultimately letting it all go, you know, instead of being attached to it or attached. And as I listened to you, I was just blown away, first of all, because you're so poetic <laughs> and uh, how you uh, frame things and express is just uh, truly divine and certainly um, touches us far deeper than the mind or than our uh, awareness here. So thank you for that and thank for being for with words. us. Thank you so much for your words. And um, I'm, ex I'm excited. I, I, I look forward to seeing your-, your We need to work. talk. <laughs> yes. yes, yes, yes. And there's one thing that you said that I'd love to touch on because it was something that became really, really clear to me, particularly as I tapped into the uh, dissolving aspect um, of the Grace's book as, as it was coming through and as I was going through that part of the experience. And it's that 
use of the word letting go. And I think that's another thing in our spiritual and personal growth world that we've gotten used to saying is to let go and all of those things. And what, what came to me and, and the process that I was utilizing was not what most people or their mind would say is letting go. It was absorbing. It was, every, it was almost as if I was absorbing all of the emotions. So, so by me expressing whatever emotions I had, it was almost by that recognition and that awareness and that being with, it was the absorption of me back to myself. It was, it was as if I was the universe, the void, pulling all this back in that had been held at bay or held away almost as if it had already been let go and now had to be brought back. And so that's another reframing that I feel like is very important for a lot of people because mm -hmm. we, we live in a society that wants to run away and push away. And um, sometimes the words are interpreted as if we are to really distance ourselves when that is the very thing that is is creating so many of our issues. But if we can see everything as an embrace and it's absorption, um, mm -hmm. as a connection, then that's yes. the place to go. And I'm sure you, I'm sure <laughs> your work, that's, that's what you have found too. Yes. And when you also said, you know, it isn't about being uh, just knowing or trying or striving to be purely divine, pure essence. I remember doing a healing once and this woman says, how can I let go of ego? And this voice deep from within me in this intuitive uh, altered state said that, oh, you mortals and your egos, you know, instead of fighting, I mean, it was like this deep voice was, oh, you mortals and your egos, you know, instead of fighting it or, or rejecting it, embrace it, express your divinity through your humanity it is a part of you. It is how you express that divine part of you. So, I mean, I just yes. loved what you said. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's interesting. I always um, have seen people would say, I want to not be in that energy. I put up a wall. I'm going to zip it or put my protection. In. And what you're saying too, it's, it's so true to embrace it all and realize that that is you, a part of you. And so if I become conscious of it and embrace it, I can choose where I want to have it within me rather than be sabotaged with it. Yes. Yes. Because I think when we are moving in the energy of trying to shield ourselves or push something away or even judging it, then we are in that same passionate place, which is still a shadow. And, and, and not realizing it, you know, any type of passion about something is going to be a shadow. But if we can just embrace it and hold it and be present to it, that state of neutrality doesn't allow anything to hurt anyone. Mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't allow any energy to be negative or positive. It's just neutral. It just is. And what are we all but a state of isness? Ultimately, that's what we are but we're trying to do stuff with everything rather than just letting everything be isness and allowing this human experience to be celebrated for all of the, uh, the theme park that it is. I talk about in the books how, you know, our, our world and our life, it really is this huge adventure theme park. It's like haunted houses and roller coasters and spinning wheels. And we get to do all this stuff. It really is a playground but we haven't looked at it that way. And if we would just look at it that way, we would see that all these things, conflicts, chaos, you know, all of these things are the stuff we usually go pay for, you know, at Halloween, we go pay for haunted houses. But when we meet the dark in person, we're like, ah, I don't want to touch that. <laughs> so it's a little ironic that, um, that we'll pay for stuff when we, we can get it for free. <laughs> nice. Nice. And what, Doc, uh, what Pamela was saying about the ego too, um, it's wonderful that the observed ego, it's like this beautiful channel of the divine energy of, of universe coming through our ego into our reality, into the infinite reality. So the ability to observe that and to expand it where you want to play with it and, you know, contract it where you want to experience something. Yes. Mm. 
I think uh, Karen uh, Trujillo Heffernan wanted to jump in to the conversation. Go ahead, Karen. Yeah, so two things. I'll start with the second one because you just addressed it. It's so funny. In the last year and a half, I've been saying I get overwhelmed with all the crisis in the world and sometimes freeze up. But then I just kept saying like, okay, I'm just going to picture life like Disneyland. It's an adventure park. And I've been saying that over and over. So I love that the universe is, you know, <laughs> right there with that. And you, I think you really... You, you really probably answered this in your response to Pamela, but you might have a little more insight on it. For about three and a half years now, I've been sharing, you know, with the people I work with that I feel like when I go to sleep at night, that I'm, it's like the butterfly, like I turn into the liquid and then the next morning I'm this new butterfly. And there were more intense times like in 2020 where I was like, it's happening every night, you know? And, and I felt like, so when you said, I've died so many times in this lifetime. My question was going to be, um, you know, in terms of letting go and like, so what parts of me do I keep and what parts of me let go? But I feel like you might've addressed that in the absorption piece. So while I may not, I may, I may really die and a part of me dies off that, that no longer needs to serve in the forefront, but somewhere that energy is absorbed and it's just, I guess, maybe enriching this new part of who I am. You know, I think it ultimately boils down to first getting really clear on what it is we want out of this life, why we believe our soul came. Something within me when I started 1111 Magazine years ago, I unknowingly, I, I got the byline, I had an experience and the byline was given to me and the byline was devoted to the journey of the soul. So unknowingly that became my intention, that became my longing to just be devoted to whatever the soul wanted. And, and my life has played out that way. So for me, the death would be of every identity and my experiences have allowed for that. So I've I've died as the daughter, I've died as the sister, I've died as the mother, I've died as the business person, I've died as all of these things. I got to the place where I died into being no one because there was nothing left. I stopped everything for those seven years. So I was none of those things. And I was willing to be no one and nobody. But that's the only way to then become everyone and everybody. Because when you're nothing, when you're no one, when you have no attachment to ego, identity, expression, personality, agenda, making money, building a business, any of those kinds of things, all of a sudden, all you can be is compassionate presence to every single person on the planet exactly where they are. And you find that in yourself. And then you realize, wow, why was I clinging to one identity? I'm 8 billion of them. And, and it just creates a completely different experience of love and of seeing and of hearing and acknowledging. And so I think every individual has to decide first and foremost, am I here for my ego or am I here for my soul? Am I here for a specific identity? And is that identity the greatest God essence that I can possibly be? And what is that beyond what my ego tells me it is? And once you're clear on that, then when you bump up against the spiral of blessings or anything that wants to take down that image of who you believe yourself to be, it becomes a lot easier to allow that to simply dissolve and to have a wider lens and to live to a higher octave than what you currently do. And that's a whole different experience of humanity than anything you've experienced before. Yeah, thank you. You're just, I mean, my whole like business, for lack of a better word, is called Surf in Your Soul. So my mission is how do we, you know, all live in our soul, but I'm in this process these last few years of what you just described, the daughter, the sister, the mother, and, and I'll go for away for a while and let those go and then I'll step right back into it. So really beautiful timing. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one of the illusions in the second book is the illusion of money. And that came through really strongly. Um, you know, when I stopped, it was a complete stopping. So there was no income. There was nothing. All that I cared about was what is this supposed to teach me? And 
that's when I truly discovered the illusion that money is. That's when I truly was able to sit back and watch the world and watch how we women have become so masculine, watch how the world has taken business and turned it into this machine to just keep us rolling. And it was like, wow, we really have fallen victim to this illusion, but it is an illusion because everything I needed showed up when I needed it, even though I was doing nothing but being present to myself. And that's why I'm such a advocate for people to really understand your presence truly is enough. If you really would let yourself get to that place of trust of knowing that your presence is enough, then you will discover how much of a facade so much of what life is um, or has been taught is. And then you can start really letting the identities go. I don't want to stop you, but I want to ask a question. Anyway, it's so good to see you and I adore you and your work. And it's wonderful to see you, Jennifer, too. Um, I want to ask about trust. Um, from my experience with you from previous times, it seems like my lesson that I was reinforced with from you was non-dual. It was this not good or bad, this just is. And you've gone way past that, it seems like, with this work. So could you talk about trust? Yeah, trust is a big one because I think that most of my life, I didn't trust myself first and foremost. Right. I think we all have some version of that right from that zero to seven period because we we take on these feelings and these emotions and these thoughts from the people around us and we discount what we know as these truly sacred beings that have come in. So that loss of trust happens. And then we don't trust the people outside of us. And then I didn't trust the world. And so to me, that's where the cycle of fear really comes in. And I think that that's one of the greatest good blessings, if you want to call it that, of these blessings. Because these blessings pulled my life away from me to such a degree that I had to trust. And I think that each one of us can resonate with that in some way, that we've had experiences that have just made us surrender and have to trust. But through the course of this, I also discovered a distinction about surrender because that moment, <clears throat> moment of surrender into trust, it's not that we're surrendering to the experience or to life as it is. It's an invitation to surrender to that highest expression of self while we walk the path of humanity. Beautiful. Yes. yes. You're yes. amazing. Oh, thank you, Kathy. <laughs> That's thank great. you. You know, I've just, I've been, I've been very human, which is what I've always wanted. I just wanted to be a real girl. For the longest time, I just wanted to feel because I didn't feel for 40 years of my life. And so for me to encounter these kinds of blessings, they really have been the greatest gift for me because they've taken me to this place of finally feeling, of finally feeling like a human being and not like an animal that's scared and running, right. not like a shadow that's hiding, mm -hmm. not like um, a monster that's making mistakes and doing the wrong thing at the wrong time, mm -hmm. not like someone that's striving to be someone or fit in or have an image. Um, going through this seven years and the degree to which I have delved into these layers, these multidimensional layers, um, I could not feel more comfortable in my skin. And yet the beauty of it is these different dimensions of me were operating all the time. I look back and I go, wow, I know who created 1111. I know who now wrote those books, but gosh, my life was dysfunctional at those times. How did that happen? How could I not be aware of these other parts of me and yet kick into the woman that could create 1111 or write books. And yet there was this other part of me that was just trying to get through each day and survive a tremendous amount of pain and abuse. 
And yet the human spirit is just that beautiful. It can do that. But when we can become present to all these aspects at the same time, then all of a sudden it's mind blowing. And isn't that ultimately what we're here to do is get out of the head and have our mind blown. <laughs> heart, heart opening and mind blowing. Yes. yes. <laughs> wow. I, well, so the one book's ready, but are the other, when are the other two going yes. to be ready? Living is out right now. Okay. Um, being the seven illusions that derail personal power, purpose, and peace is available for pre-order. It will ship at the end of May. Okay. Um, it's probably the darkest of the three, and it's probably my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is, the illusions to me are extraordinary. And what came through that experience is extraordinary. And uh, the last one comes out at the end of November. Okay. So and in your, in your multidimensional uh, way, you wrote all three at the same time. They were all written at the same time because all of me was happening at the same time. And so it was a very different experience writing these books than my others. With the others, they kind of flowed in chapter by chapter and I wrote them. But these, I would be writing a paragraph in chapter two of book one, and then I'd be writing a paragraph in chapter eight of book three. And <laughs> it was it was chaos, which is, isn't that where creation comes from? So see, I was even in chaos, the blessing of chaos during my creativity. <laughs> <laughs> were you saying something noel you're on mute uh i was saying wow um, <laughs> um bob has some questions uh comments that he wanted to make so. yeah thanks um just this last interchange simran it's um just really um see how much peace you have you really have peace. Uh, I was, I'd like to ask if you would expand a little bit more about this before your seven years old thing uh, that you mentioned early on. When the note I wrote down was, maybe correctly, illusion of beliefs taken on in childhood. And then you said something about up until the age of seven. Could you, and when you said that, it kind of like struck me. I don't know what it struck, but it something struck me. And uh, so would you expand on that a little bit more? Yes, yes. So in our growth and development, we have three cycles of seven that take place. The first one is age zero to seven, and that is strictly physiology. We soak up everything. It's all energetic. We learn by modeling, and then we take all that in. The second set is ages seven to 14. And that is when the emotional body forms around us. So then we start to make sense of things by feeling. And then the third set of seven is 14 to 21. And that's when the intellectual body forms and we try to make sense of our lives. And we either shut down the emotion or we try to make up something about the emotion and the sensations that we feel in the body. But what I discovered that I've never seen anywhere else in any other book is that zero to seven period is actually what creates the rest of our lives and what we create our circumstances and experiences from. And it all comes from the physiology. And so what ends up happening is we have a series of echoes. So I had an experience in my life at the age of four. And that experience was when I first felt a huge wave of fear from someone else. And it just blanketed my entire body. And I also ended up having another experience shortly after that, that was more love, but it was drenched in sadness. And so if I, when I looked back, I had the same kind of experience every seven years until I got to the place where I remembered that four-year-old experience. So at age 11, I had the same experience of fear and love. At age 18, at age 25, and so if people will look at their lives and let's say they had a loss of a person at uh, a certain age, they will find that they will have a loss to have to re-experience that grief to just try to take them back to dissolving what's in the physiology. But what we tend to do is either repress it and not feel it fully. So we never get it, get to that place, or we intellectualize it and that never goes to the body. So then we don't understand why we age. 
We don't understand why we have aches and pains. And then again, the mind gets involved. The conditioning of our world gets involved. We get medicated or we get operated on or we get all these things. Whereas if we really would just go back to feeling everything so that it dissolves by pure presence, most of our ailments would actually heal. One thing that I did discover through my process, because as I went into my process of life and challenge and conflict and chaos, I aged quite a bit. I watched myself age. I watched my body change. I watched all those things happen. I watched my vision get worse. I watched aches and pains take place. Um, and then as I let myself continue being present to everything that was happening and fully feeling every emotion, I watched myself reverse age. I watched everything then go the other direction. So we have pulled full power over this physiology, but it's our willingness to be present to everything and hold it with that type of sacredness that gives us that type of power. Uh, I want to jump in no, here. Thank you. You okay, Bob? Yeah. I want to I'd jump like to in. to reflect on, thank you. Yes. There's uh, some expression or statement that someone said, show me a, a child at seven and I'll show you the man. Mm -hmm. So that was the, you know, the statement by some famous person I can't remember. And I'm, but so these researchers in England decided that they were going to do a longitudinal study of a uh, different group of children, different socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, you know, you know, different sides of the track, everything. And they followed them and brought them in and interviewed them or whatever they did with them every seven years from the age of seven to 56. Hopefully that's a multiple of seven. And, um, it's fascinating. It Bob and I just, you know, we got it from the library. We kept on, oh my God, what's going to happen after they're 21? You know, but it really didn't, you know, bear out, you know, the ones that they thought were, you know, other side of the track was scruffy and would never went to school and versus the blue bloods, would they be, you know, who was happier in life? But it really came down to what are you measuring? You know, and, um, I don't think they were measuring multidimensional selves no. or uh, souls, but uh, it was very fascinating because it, you know, it uh, it um, it did bear out it for some of them. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I think it was called Seven Up. Seven Up, there it is. Seven up. I'll have to. Seven look Up, it. yeah. BBC special. It was BBC. a BBC, yeah. And then because the study went on so long, the original. Um, a researcher uh, transitioned and one of his graduate students had to take over. But it's really a fascinating, fascinating um, uh, study. It looks like they're doing it again with millennials or something. But um, I, I just, I don't know, I felt called to say that. But what I found- I invite everybody to really, you know, look at your life, look at the last time mm -hmm. that you had a challenge or look at where you are in life right now and just go back every seven years, you will see for yourself, you're at the same place in it, maybe with different people in a different city, different mm -hmm. relationship, but you will see the echo of, of where it goes back to. Mm -hmm. And when you find that origination point, that's really what you are there to be with. And once you are with that, then all of a sudden, if it is a uh, series of echoes that feel challenging or, or painful or difficult, dissolving that physiological piece from the beginning will shift that experience going forward so that you won't have it the, the seven years following. Mm -hmm. But uh, as long as we keep ignoring it, we okay. keep creating that, that ripple, that echoes. It's just like throwing a pebble in a pond. When you throw that pebble, that ripple shows up every so often. It's exactly how we live our lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sitting here going, doing the sevens and... Uh... <laughs> Okay, now I'm um, how old? Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I have thought of that before, but I never really um, related to any, to my soul, I guess. You know, I just think, oh, okay. Didn't I learn that last time? <laughs> I have a lot of those kinds of uh, moments. 
but um, it's uh, interesting we um talk about the in mystery schools in the esoteric schools they talk about the the deaths you have in in life while you're living so they're talking about past lives within the this life mm -hmm. but they talk about seven of them and the and the I just thought that was interesting when you were talking about um, sevens too, you know, every seven years or, but yeah. It's interesting to contemplate and it just, it just pro provides another framework as to how intricately beautiful we are and, and how we are sacred geometry in a sense, you know, we are these multidimensional faceted crystals that just have such beauty and when you look at us and you look inside of us you can't ever see the same thing twice you're going to see another face or another another sheen or uh, just so many parts of us and i think it's it's really about coming to celebrate all of us every experience every expression every nuance that we are and valuing that to such a degree as that sacred essence because when we can do that then I can look at you, I can look at Kathy, I can look at Bob, I can look at everybody and see that same thing without, you know, any envy, any anger, any sadness, any apathy. But unless I'm willing to see myself in my full glory, animal, monster, demon, angel, goddess, you know, I can't see that with anyone else. Beautiful. Go ahead, Pamela. You're muted. You're beautiful. Okay. Um, one other thing that you alluded to has been a challenge of mine, and I think it has to do with our desire to uh, be more holy, more whatever. And so I'm trying to reframe my language about uh, the journey, for one thing, um, because that alludes to the fact that we're always striving and trying and, and searching and seeking and on this spiritual treadmill to the point where we fail to realize our divinity instead, you know, instead of trying to uh, uh, search for it or grasp it or something like that. And so this whole illusion of you know wanting something else something more something better is something that i ha have have been trying to work more with and so i wondered if you'd just address that too that was the place that i really reached at um at an integrated level through the third book knowing it, it's explained it there's this flowering of the senses there's this this awareness as the shedding is happening. Um, you know, some of the graces involve simplicity. And, and I'm sure all of you have gone through that experience where you hit up a, against a moment in your life and all of a sudden you just know it's time for everything to go. I've got to get rid of all the clothes. I've got to get rid of the furniture. I've got rid of the house. I've got to get rid of, like, we've all been there. It's just part, it's one of the self-giving <laughs> graces. And, you know, after that, there's, you know, the, the grace of, of detachment where we have to detach, which means really fully feel everything, but not be attached to the outcome or the grace of dispassion where we have to let go of the passion of everything and really just be neutral. So there are these graces that come in. And as we give ourselves these graces, it opens up these subtle senses, these deeper levels of the aura. But what was most important was it helped me tap into what was viscerally being held down visceral things such as resentment, regret, those things that we as identities don't ever want to claim that we have. But when you actually tap into the feeling of that that is buried so deeply in yourselves that you never knew, you will be horrified <laughs> for one thing because of what it's feel like. You will be awakened to a part of you that you really didn't know. But all of a sudden there's this sight of the self it awakens this holiness. I, it's paradoxical because it's, it's, it's almost as the deeper you're willing to go into the depths of yourself and see what your ego just never wanted to believe was you, 
it opens the window to the holiness of the self at the same time. So it's it's like it's a double portal, but you can't get to one without the other. And and I think that that is why I put these three books together. I never intended to write books. I told the universe I'm not interested in writing any books. <laughs> not even interested in publishing them. So I'm not going to look for a publisher. And the publisher came to me and asked me for them. So, you know, they're meant to be out here. And they're the books that I wish I had had when I was born. I wish they had come with me as the manual of how to move through this life and what my soul wanted as I moved through this life so that my path stayed on course and there were no distractions. So if I can give that gift to others and show them a shorter, easier, gentler route to the flowering of their humanity and the opening of those paradoxical doorways, then that's what these three books are. I have another question. Um, it seems like time is speeding up and um, the energies have just been wicked strong, I think, <laughs> the past at least week, it's just been octaves higher. How do you think time is going to be affected in this transition phase that we're in for humanity? Because maybe it's not seven years for the are these new consciousnesses that are being integrated here. These new beings that are coming in are so different. There's such an upgrade. <laughs> what do you think about time? Well, in my second book, I write that time is an illusion. It's a construct that we created and that we needed for life. And I think that time exists because we are a deeply distracted species. And so we have, through our consciousness, created this construct that we are going to feel oppressed by because we are creating the oppression within ourselves. Mm -hmm. And as more and more people really get to a place of letting go of the things that are the distractions, because in truth, most of, of what we as human beings engage in, it really is distraction to not feel. Mm -hmm. So the more we get present with ourselves, time really does stretch. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden we tap into that place of timelessness where time is shown to be that illusion. I think that the new kids that are coming in, I think that the millennials and the ones behind them, they already illustrate that to quite a degree. And our planet's going to be fine despite us. I think yes. that, you know, those of our age, we came in and did what we were supposed to do. We were supposed to be the ones that went through the healing and the difficulty and the, you know, all of that piece. And and that's okay because we laid the groundwork and paved a way for these other generations to be able to come in. As I wrote these books, I wondered, are they ahead of their time? Are they for the people of this time? And I do think they're of great value for anyone at this time that wants to accelerate. They don't need to take the seven years that I took. It is laid out. If they just daily go through a page, they will get there on their own without having to go through seven years. But I do think that they are laid out for future generations to not slip back into the places that perhaps past generations have fallen into and to understand how to really embody and bring about a collective understanding of personal power, purpose, and peace and how that's far greater than what the mind is making up. Beautiful. Thank you. I think it's a, they're beautiful maps of the territory of, of how we're going through this. And also, um, and it's interesting, we still, because we're in our mind in the way we think, we think of time as that arrow or time faster or slower. But if you think of time as a territory that we can play around in, it's when we become more and more conscious about it, that it becomes that timelessness that we can actually move through it at different rates and different speeds. Okay. And it's because most of us are living on the horizontal spectrum we are not living in vertical alignment. So as more and more individuals get into vertical alignment, the natural byproduct is going to be timelessness. Beautiful. And then we start connecting with different dimensions, times of ourself and different, our, our soul exists in, as a frequency in so many places, many times that it just, yeah. 
that's where I like to play. <laughs> <laughs> so beautiful. Well, thank you, Simran. I wanted to uh, mention your website. I am Simran.com. Yes. Um, especially, I actually was playing around there, and you have your art there, and it's one of these little. You don't. You have your other all the other things you're doing that we'd forget that you're an artist as well. Oh wow! All of that came through in the seven years, um, the paintings and everything, and so it, it was a very creative time. And and I think that oftentimes our darkness is what spurs our great creativity because we are resting inside the void space. And that's really where the soul and the greater cosmos can speak through us. So it was quite fascinating to see what came through in paintings wow. as I moved through this. We have a friend, um, many of the people here know um, Leanne Hetzel, and she does um, artwork that it's about her energies and it's called meta art. But sometimes when you see art that comes through like that, there's so much in it. Like she does an art piece that's called peace or love or and the frequency is in that painting. Mm. You think of the transformation, what you were going through, that frequency is in all of your paintings. Exactly. It's beautiful. Well, Very nice. I want to thank uh, everyone, Simron, Jennifer. Also, you can reach Jennifer Ivanko at jenniferivanko.com. And you have trips coming up and you have you. your radio um, show. So. And I just want to mention one thing, because starting okay. in May, I'm doing Manifesting Mondays. And it's just going to give some time, because it's so important for us to take time to envision what we want, instead of being bombarded all the time with what is out there. So I want to just give time for people to step into their visions. So it's I in visioning. And just spend an hour of just every month, I mean, every week on Mondays, we're going to do it. Okay, so. is that going to be on... Uh... Do we sign up for that? Go to your website and sign up for that? Is that how we... Go to my website. Probably next week I'll have it posted and we'll start registering and it's free. It's going to be something to just really Wonderful. come together. Wonderful. Get our imaginations going to bring it in, bring it into form. Thank you everyone for being here. It was so delightful, Simran. And just you can unmute and give some love for this beautiful... It's a lot to process though. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm so dense sometimes, <laughs> but it's okay. <laughs> All of a sudden, I'd have a question and then it'd go here, and I went, no, I'm going to follow over here. You know, it was really, really wonderful. And uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. Mm. Marco, you joined us late, but you can get the recording. Thank you. We'll have it on our archives in a couple of days, Marco. Yes. Okay, thank thanks. Very it's very interesting and real into what I've been going through lately. Yeah. Oh, okay. Very good. And so the one book is available now and the other two are in the works. The other second one can be pre-ordered and- Living is available now. Being is available for pre-order and ships at the end of May. And Knowing is also available for pre-order and ships at the end of November. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Are right at the so top much. of the website. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. What a delightful thank evening. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. I hope to ball. be able to reach you through your website. Yes, please do. Okay. So, I, I've got her email too. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. So, <laughs> I do too. Oh, yeah. Kathy, <laughs> Kathy helped me with my most recent book called The Dance of Ego and Essence Confessions of a Divine Diva. And uh, it was a 40 day rebirthing um, yeah. process through radical honesty and purging. Yeah. So it sells speak. all. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you guys have a lot in common. A lot to, a lot to share. Okay. Blessings. So thank nice you. to see you, Jennifer. Good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank well, you. Good night, everyone. See night you next all. Thursday. Bye. Love you. Next you. Thursday. Bye. Bye.